Welcome, my dear viewers, thank you for being with my channel and watching my videos, I'm telling you a story from my life, watch this video to the end, you will understand what I'm telling you, so as not to miss my new videos. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel and leave your explanations in the comments then let's go. At last, the day arrived when I could escape the constant sight of your face. Those freeloaders, who did nothing but consume without contributing, needed to go. They should be grateful for the charity they've received all this time. Understood. I declared, I won't be coming back. Thank you for everything until now. Swiftly, I gathered my essentials and bid farewell to the place I had called my in-laws home for many years. As I left, my mother-in-law wore a satisfied expression, relishing my departure. However, only I harbored a certain poignant truth. My name is Sarah. I'm 32 years old and work remotely from home. Married to Alan for five years, our marital bliss took a turn in our fourth year when Alan's previously robust father fell ill, necessitating our presence and care. Initially resistant to the idea of living with my in-laws, I acquiesced due to Alan being their sole source of familial support. Despite contemplating quitting my job for his care, my company permitted me to continue working remotely, considering my past performance. The complications with my in-laws began immediately, familiarizing me with the notorious mother-in-law and daughter-in-law dynamic. Sarah, hurry up and tend to the cooking and cleaning. How long will you be lazy, avoiding your household duties? Scolded my mother-in-law. I'm working right now. What are you talking about? I'm always clicking away on the computer, I retorted. The truth was, amidst household chores and caring for my ailing father-in-law, I utilized my skills to regain my pre-crisis salary. After about three months of intense effort, when my earnings matched their previous peak, I felt genuine joy. However, the reason for my relentless dedication lay in the financial reality. Alan's income alone couldn't sustain us. Despite my hopes that life would finally ease up, the struggle continued. I contemplated setting aside some savings, but inexplicably, circumstances grew increasingly challenging. It felt as though the funds in my wallet were in a constant state of decline. Intrigued by this, I scrutinized our expenses and discovered that Alan had been indulging in lavish spending. Furthermore, my mother-in-law exhibited a penchant for extravagant habits. Alan, always eager to please others, extended his generosity beyond work lunches, using our credit cards to fund drinking parties. My mother-in-law, juggling numerous hobbies with friends, liberally paid for lessons and social gatherings. Despite their profligate ways, the burden of household chores and caring for my ailing father-in-law fell solely on me. I found myself covering all our living expenses with my income, making the prospect of saving money seem like a distant dream. Anxious about our financial situation, I approach Alan and my mother-in-law. Alan, mother, it seems we've been spending excessively. If this continues, we'll deplete our finances. Could you please consider cutting back on your expenses? I implored. In response, Alan and my mother-in-law harshly dismissed my concerns. I don't want you to appear stingy in front of my colleagues and subordinates. Can't you understand that? Argued Alan. They won't think you're stingy just because you don't pay for them every single time, I reasoned. Maintaining good relationships with your co-workers is important, but what about the trips to the girls' bars? That has nothing to do with work, I pointed out. You just want to have fun, don't you? How about you come home drunk and start talking about it, even if no one asks you? That just means you have a more enjoyable time there than spending time with me. I expressed my frustration. My mother-in-law sided with Alan, laughing off my concerns. I'm glad mom understands, and she's right, Alan asserted. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law justified her spending stating, if I didn't go to my classes, I'd just be cooped up at home. I'm taking classes with my friends to enjoy the limited time. I found myself grappling with the harsh words echoing in my ears, labeling me as a terrible daughter-in-law. 
Their judgmental remarks centered on the fact that I dedicated myself to household chores without earning an income, rendering me, in their eyes, without the right to voice complaints. The notion of being looked down upon by a homemaker left me perplexed. In truth, I worked diligently, contributing a steady income to the household while also managing the housework and caring for my father-in-law. Their skepticism and belittling tone, asserting that working from home couldn't yield much, were disheartening. Even more so, my mother-in-law had apparently fed Alan a distorted narrative, implying that she alone took care of my father-in-law, painting me as an idle homemaker. The injustice of their perception left me speechless. Despite the countless moments when I contemplated leaving that challenging environment, the anchor that held me was my deep concern for my father-in-law. Since the early days of my marriage, he had consistently treated me with kindness, in stark contrast to Alan and my mother-in-law, his expressions of gratitude, acknowledging me as a wonderful daughter-in-law, resonated in my heart. Whenever he required care, he would apologize for the burden while expressing gratitude for my efforts. In these moments, I found solace and purpose in caring for him. I couldn't fathom leaving him to the whims of Alan and my mother-in-law. Father-in-law, it seemed, had been keenly aware of the family's dynamics, recognizing my contributions in maintaining our household's financial stability. His words of appreciation, acknowledging the importance of my efforts, became a source of strength. The anxiety about the fate of this household without my presence was overshadowed by the greater concern for my beloved father-in-law. Thus, I made the decision to personally provide dedicated care until my father-in-law's passing a year later. The somber occasion of his funeral became an emotional battleground for me. Despite my heartfelt grief, my tears were met with disapproval. Why are you crying so much, Sarah? Father-in-law has passed away. Isn't mourning like this natural? I was asked, but my response seemed to provoke irritation from my mother-in-law. She accused me of making it sound as if she had never taken care of him at all. The truth, however, was starkly different. My mother-in-law had hardly been involved in my father-in-law's care. Her preoccupation with hobbies and frequent outings left me as the primary caregiver. Despite my efforts, she portrayed herself as the oppressed and pitiful mother-in-law to outsiders, painting me as the cruel daughter-in-law. In the eyes of relatives, it seemed as though I was being too harsh on my mother-in-law. Even in the midst of mourning, I found myself criticized by those who understood little of the dynamics. Frustrated, I chose to distance myself from the relatives. However, this move did not go unnoticed by Ellen, who approached me with complaints. You embarrassed mom in front of everyone, he accused. That doesn't make any sense. I was only crying about father-in-law's death. Despite that, your mom told me it was strange for me to cry. I never said she hadn't taken care of dad at all. I just talked about mourning the loss of my father-in-law, whom I had always cared for. I defended myself. In the escalating argument, Ellen accused me of insulting his mother and suggested that if it bothered me so much, I should have cared for his father myself. The clash intensified, prompting the intervention of relatives who finally put an end to our quarrel. Following that incident, I maintained complete silence with my husband. After the funeral proceedings concluded, a lawyer arrived to discuss the inheritance. The lawyer began... I'd like to discuss the contents of the will regarding your late father's estate. Firstly, to the wife and daughter-in-law, Sarah, he's left half of his cash to each of you. To his son, Ellen, he's left ownership of the family land and home. My mother-in-law questioned, What if Ellen gets the land in the house? Doesn't that mean all the other assets go to the wife? Why is Sarah receiving an inheritance? She's not related by blood. The lawyer responded, Your husband was deeply grateful to Sarah for the dedicated care she gave him. He wanted to express his gratitude by giving her part of the inheritance. This decision cannot be changed. 
Unable to accept this, my mother-in-law accused, I can't believe it. You were caring for him just to get the inheritance, weren't you? I defended myself, explaining, I had a good relationship with my father-in-law since I got married. I took care of him to express my gratitude. My mother-in-law continued with her accusations, suggesting it was psychological abuse. Frustrated, she eventually gave up, and the lawyer continued, So that was Dad's decision. It's gratitude for Sarah's caring, right? If that's the case, then we have no choice but to follow it. May I continue? As the lawyer proceeded, my mother-in-law's discontented expression turned into a smile, and she exclaimed, Yes, that's great. I understand. Confused, my husband questioned her. What do you mean? But my mother-in-law seemed pleased and explained, Now that Dad's living is over, it's no longer necessary to rely on Sarah. Her inheritance is nothing more than severance pay. We don't need her in this house anymore. My mother-in-law had misunderstood my father-in-law's will, just as he had intended. In truth, he had discussed this plan with me before his passing. He wanted me to be free from the constraints of this house after his demise. Using the will, he cleverly deceived my husband and mother-in-law, making it seem natural for me to leave, just as he had planned. My mother-in-law, misinterpreting my father-in-law's intentions, saw the will as an opportunity to eject me from the family. Concealing my actual desire to leave, I responded to her shock by saying, Father-in-law, why would you treat me like this? Even to Dad, I was just someone taking care of him. Ellen, you can't understand Sarah anymore, right? Why don't you just divorce her? Looking at Ellen with tearful eyes, I pleaded, and after contemplating for a moment, he agreed, you know what, let's get a divorce. I've inherited the family home and land, and mom got some money too. There's no longer any need to worry about living, so there's no problem if Sarah goes. What do you mean by that? Just what I said. I feel bad for asking, but could you leave our house and agree to the divorce? Understanding that there was no place for me there anymore, I agreed. Understood. I guess there's no place for me here anymore. With a hint of restraint, I retrieved a document from the drawer and handed it to my husband. It was a notice of filing for divorce, prepared after our previous argument. My husband promptly signed it, expressing, Finally, I don't have to deal with you anymore. A non-working freeloader should just get out. You should be grateful for us having put up with you, a total freeloader. Is that so? Okay, I understand. I'll leave. Thank you for things up to now. As I left, my mother-in-law appeared elated, unaware of what would transpire in the future of their house. Once out of their home, I wasted no time and immediately submitted the divorce notice to the city hall. Arriving at the apartment I had rented in advance, the spacious room echoed with my joy as I exclaimed, Finally, I can be by myself. This is great. I felt overwhelmed with joy to be liberated from a challenging marriage. My heartfelt gratitude extended to my father-in-law for devising the plan that enabled my escape from my in-law's home. Subsequently, I embraced a comfortable life living on my own, appreciating the newfound freedom and the ability to continue working remotely, a skill I had cultivated during my time at my in-law's place. Having honed my time management skills, work flowed smoothly and my income increased, allowing me to lead a comfortable life free from interference. However, my peaceful existence took an unexpected turn when my ex-husband, Alan, called me out of the blue. Perplexed, I questioned. It's been a while. Why are you calling me? Weren't you the one telling me to disappear? Sarah, please help us. We're in a pinch, Alan pleaded. I chuckled, finding the situation ironic. What kind of joke is this? My salary hasn't changed, but for some reason, you're running out of money. We can't live like this. With a laugh, I decided to deliver the final blow. That's because you no longer have my income to support you. You squandered your entire salary on yourself. 
Maybe it's about time you and your mother learn some financial responsibility as adults. Confused, Alan asked, What do you mean? You still don't get it. I clarified. While you were living lavishly, my salary was the one paying for our living expenses. At that time, I was making about $4,800 a month. Now I'm earning even more than that with no one to get in my way. Expressing frustration, Alan pleaded, Sarah, can't we start over? It was a mistake to let you go. I want to make things right again. I scoffed. It's obvious you're after my income. Don't be ridiculous. I never want to see your face again. What happened to the inheritance your mother received? With that amount, she should be living comfortably. Alan confessed. It's about to run out. We spend it on a shopping spree, overseas trips, and half of it disappeared in the casino. Unmoved, I retorted. A foolish mother breeds a foolish son. I have nothing more to say to you. I'm a stranger now, and I can't do anything for you, nor do I want to. Desperate, Alan implored, don't be so heartless. Help me. This has nothing to do with me. There's nothing more to talk about. I'm hanging up. Don't call me again. I declare before ending the call and promptly canceling the contract for the mobile phone I was using. A year later, passing by my mother-in-law's house, I discovered it had become an empty lot, likely sold due to financial struggles. Unperturbed, I continued with my newfound spare time, attending a wine class I had long been interested in. There, I met a man two years my senior who took me seriously. After a year and a half of dating, we got married. He is the ace of a well-known company, humble despite his high salary, with a warm and wonderful character. We respect each other's careers, leading to a fulfilling married life. Reflecting on these changes, I can't help but feel that this retribution was, in a way, a gift from my father-in-law.